Hello everybody. I'm actually going to do a little video toggling right now. I ruined the big surprise. There we go. So my folk, hello folks, my name is Carrie Obrey and I'm one of the directors of Heartland Summer, which is programming for independent booksellers. Heartland is designed to connect booksellers with authors whose forthcoming books are sure to be a hit in independent bookstores this fall season. When we were telling people online that we had these two authors paired together, the most common response was the wow emoji. Just to put them together is going to generate so much positive energy and we're just thrilled. We'd especially like to thank the publishers, Grove Atlantic and Milkweed Editions for working with us to make this event a reality. Thank you Grove and Milkweed for offering the following. At the bottom of the screen, there's a button to request an advanced reader's copy of Helen McDonald's Vesper Flights. Paper and electronic copies will be shared as stock allows. And also, there's a milkweed giveaway. Two copies of the special edition of Braiding Sweetgrass will be given away in early October to two lucky booksellers from our registration list, so we'll let you know who was randomly drawn. This wonderful virtual event spans at least 4,000 miles, as Helen is in the UK and Robin is deep in the Adirondack woods, where Wi-Fi might flutter in the wind. There might be some bumps in the road, an author's video might pop off and on, but that's okay. If there's one thing this pandemic has taught us, it's to go with the flow and it's okay to not be perfect. Another benefit of social distancing is that going online has opened up our audience to a much broader set of folks. Not only do we have booksellers joining us, as we always do, we also have book lovers and customers that are part of our bookstores networks. So welcome everyone, and you know what to do. Buy these books at your local independent bookstore when they are out later this year. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour in length. We'll enjoy the conversation for about half of it or maybe a little bit more, and then we'll move on to questions. Please use the chat field liberally as you are right now, sharing comments with each other, and then post your questions for the authors in the question field where you can also vote on your favorites to bring them to the top of the pile. We had a last minute request to invite in our publisher rep, Johanna Hines. So I'm gonna do that right now and she's gonna give us a special announcement. Just one, just one second as she accepts the request. There she is. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us. I want to say that um, on behalf of Milkweed and Grove, we are so grateful to have both these authors together and partnered. I know that these authors are often two of your most um, beloved in the section. And with um, Grove has made available to bookstores um, signed copies of this book. So please get in touch with your PGW rep after this um, or message me and we can get you signed copies of uh, Vesper Flights, which um, we are only offering to indie bookstores. And then for Robin's book, we do have a um, limited edition that is coming out in October, as Carrie mentioned. And so that should also be directed to your PDW rep. And again, thank you to Heartland for hosting both of these fantastic authors. Thank you, Johanna. So now the last person that I'd like to introduce is Emily Hall Schroen, owner of Main Street Books in St. Charles, Missouri. Emily has been a birder her entire life and worked in birds of prey rehab and training centers for years. So I thought of her right away when it came time to host this event. Please take it away, Emily. Thank you so much, Carrie. Good evening, everyone. We're so, so thrilled to have you all here. Over the course of the last few fraught and confusing months, many of us have sought refuge in nature. We've broken free of the confines of our homes and launched ourselves into the outdoors to revel in its freedom. Nature offers us such a wondrous collection of activities to help us shake off the dust of our lives. Hiking, gardening, birding, just to name a few. And always we are beggared trying to describe exactly what it is that draws us into the sunshine to bask in the glory of the earth. 
in my lifetime, I could never hope to capture the exact swoop of a cardinal's wing with words or convey the precise arrangement of the petals in a spray of Queen Anne's lace. Thankfully, there are those here with us this evening who are far more adept at encapsulating the natural world in the vibrant spread of their words. I am deeply honored to introduce our guests this evening. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen <clears throat> Potawatomi Nation. She is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, which has earned her wide acclaim. She lives in Syracuse, New York, where she is an SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. The special edition of Braiding Sweetgrass will be available from Milkweed Editions on October 13th. Helen McDonald is a writer, naturalist, and an affiliated research scholar at the University of Cambridge Department of History and Philosophy of Science. She is the author of the memoir, H is for Hawk, which won the 2014 Samuel Johnson Prize and the Cost of Book Award. She is a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine and lives in Suffolk, England with an adorable parrot who is asleep right now because it is very late at night. Her new book, Vesper Flights, a collection of essays about the human relationship to the natural world will be available from Grove Atlantic on August 25th. Please welcome Robin and Helen. Hi. Hello. Ah, it's so Hello. It's the ocean. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is just so wonderful. I'm like, I'm I'm having palpitations just seeing you both on the screen together. Oh my goodness. <laughs> ah, welcome, welcome. We are so, so thrilled to have you. So I am actually going to peace out because I think the conversation uh is gonna develop much better organically between you two just absolutely wonderfully esteemed nature writers. I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, please, Robin and Helen, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Well, here we are, Robin. This is we have to entertain everyone now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I Entertaining ourselves in the woods. So. <laughs> well, I just thought, I, I just thought maybe we could just start off by being a little bit topical. Um, obviously, you know, in that wonderful introduction talked a bit about how there's been a lot of talk over the last few very grave months about people in connection with the natural world. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that as a sort of uh, as a response to the pandemic? Is that something that you thought about a lot in terms of what's going on, or? I want to be sure, Helen, you broke up just a tad oh, there. Sorry. Yeah, just, just to say, um, during, this, during this pandemic, um, there's been a lot of talk about people finding new connections to the natural world as a source of solace or, or just getting out into it as a way of dealing with what's going on. And I wondered if you'd thought about that and what that means at this particular historical moment. For sure. Um, you know, I think that here, especially because of the pandemic, it is so hard. Right at the beginning of spring, um, it was this strange juxtaposition of the beauty of spring unfolding in the way that it does. It, it was a source of regularity and grounding that I think people, gave people a lot of, of comfort. Um, but at the same time, it... it it helped us be aware of, because we were extremely vulnerable, the vulnerabilities that we inflict on, on the natural world all the time. I also think that, you know, I wonder if this happened to you too, that when you go to your favorite, uh, say, called natural areas, right? Places to hike or walk or to bird, that they were full of people. They were full of people when usually, they weren't, and at first I was a little annoyed, like, wait, this is my place, I like it quiet. But in fact, it was really exciting and hopeful that people were were finding their own solace and their own recreation and pastimes in, in being outdoors. So I think it's a good thing in that regard. I think so too, and, and, and over here in England, we had the most astonishing spring I can remember. And I, I remember reading that, um, there's a really strange phenomenon that apparently that whenever there's something really terrible happening, there tends to be bizarrely beautiful springs and summers. And I'm, there's a sort of weird historical kind of quirk. But yes, walking around here in my ridiculous chocolate boxy Suffolk village and 
you know, it's empty most of the time. The, the, the farms are very extensive here, they're mechanized, and yet you'd look out of the window and you'd see walkers, and then they just looked like pilgrims finally getting out there. There was something going on that was way more than just experiencing the landscape. It was a very kind of, there was a lot of, um, a lot of moral and emotional weight behind those, those walks, and it was really astonishing to see, yeah. I think pilgrims is just the right word. Um, there is there is something so deeply meaningful when when we feel constrained and limited to say nothing of of really existential angst about everything that's unfolding um, to to feel that security of of the natural world to feel your feet on the ground um, it helps you just reevaluate your priorities you know if there's anything that the so-called lockdown has done it's to make us value what we value and and help us give us this pause to remember um, first of all how little we need in the world and and what it is. I found myself um, thinking a lot about how there was a lot of talk about how you can get out into the countryside as a way of, you know, escaping, um, you know, being stuck inside because it's quite safe outside. And I thought a lot about how those kind of calls left out a lot of people who live in straightened financial circumstances in urban places. And I remember looking above my, I'm not a particularly house proud person. And um, there was a female spider who's made an egg case right above my oven. And I remember thinking about this and looking up at her and there she was, you know, her world is not my world, but we share space. And there was something about realizing that paying attention to the natural world in very small ways, the right kind of attention can just blow the world wide open. You know, the wild can be tiny. It can be a tiny, it can be moss on your windowsill or a spider in your kitchen. You don't have to go out into those giant extensive landscapes to feel its venison. Um, so that was lovely for me that moment. Mm. And it paints so perfectly the, the value of attention, right? Um, and to that, to that spider, to that one bird nest, to to anything that's around you, and that's one of the things that, well, that I love both about science and literature is that they are grounded in attention, and and that that is something which is available to all of us. All it takes is slowing down and you know using what we are given, but. That's another element of, of this particular moment in time or that we're slowing down and, and taking time to, to pay attention. Um, and you know, it's that strange thing, as you said, the spider is so different from you. It is that, that for me, that immense joy of being invited into some other being's life. But the, but the paradox is that you also feel kinship at the same time that you feel that, um, otherness and the wonder that comes from otherness there's also that sense of um we're in this together you spider and i absolutely and i think you know um so my collection is very various um there are essays in it that range from everything from migraines to um there's a there's a report of a refugee's journey to britain there's all sorts of things that are not about nature in it but there's a lot of talk in it about how one of the most pressing things i believe is is to learn to love difference. It's something that we are so bad at doing historically and culturally. And um, there's a wonderful, one of the essays in your book, the one about salamanders, I think ends on that precise note, that notion of getting close to a creature whose world is not like ours, that we traditionally consider to be a little bit weird and slimy and <laughs> like, but, but knowing, extending generosity towards those creatures is, a, is an act that is good for our hearts and the way we see others as well as the creatures. So I, I really want to thank you for that particular one because it chimes so much with how I, how I think about the natural world these days. Helen, I found the same thing when I, in fact, I copied it out because I love it and I want to have it on my office door to think what it might mean to love those that are not like you, um, that yours is not the only way to see. Yes. And that, of course, extending to these intelligences other than our own, you know, warbler intelligence and salamander intelligence, all of those. But 
but also the extension of that kind of respect and wonder within our own species of what is it like to be you. Um, and that is, I think, part of the pathway to justice is to be able to really see, to see each other, to inhabit for just a, a moment what, what that life might be like. And that's one of the challenges. And, and for me, um, joys is of inviting one into the other of plants um, because they're like so different, so different that I was reflecting on the fact that in, in Potawatomi culture, we consider our relatives to be our clan members, but all of the clans are animal clans. Um, there are no plant clans despite the fact that the plants are so incredibly important and respected. And I, as I thought about that, I, it came down to that otherness. You know, there's almost a way of saying that, that the plant people are so different from us that we, we don't consider them our, our, our direct family members, um, kinfolk in a larger way. Mm. Um, but but, but they're like distant, distant cousins sort of. Yes, yeah. Right. In, in that we're all alive and 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 respected and revered, um, but living our lives in such profoundly different ways. I want to thank you also for the, talking about this notion of communicating with plants. There's a another essay in 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 Braiding Sweet Sweetgrass where you talk about experiments as being ways of having conversations with plants, rather than. You know, I, I, my, my background is, you know, a very strange one. I, I was a literature student. I was a crazed naturalist when I was a child. I still am. Uh, my maths is terrible. I mean, really appalling. So I studied literature, which I'm really pleased about. And then I ended up breeding falcons for a while, which is what you do after an English degree. Um, <laughs> but then I went back and worked in the history of science and, and, and thinking about the ways in which we have learnt to engage with the natural world and you write about it so beautifully in in, in the book about um the ways in which it, it becomes behind a pane of glass um it becomes something which isn't utterly separate from us and i just think that that is another thing that i'm really fascinated with you know all the scientists i know all the botanists all the ornithologists have enormous passion for their organisms but they're not allowed to show it and they're not allowed to use that to guide in many ways their research um, and I don't know I just wanted to sort of say thank you for the conversation thing it's really changed how I think about engaging with the natural world as a conversation it's beautiful yeah I I love the thinking about doing science in such a way that we're not learning about the the organisms but that we're learning from them yeah. and that frame shift is is I've lost Robin briefly no, nope. hello, Robin. Can we? I can't hear you. I can hear you now. Oh, good, good. Okay. We heard phone shift, and then you stopped for me. I don't know if you stopped for everybody, but um... the frame shift of learning from rather than learning about. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to tell you, Helen, I, I was um, talking to a group of uh, students this afternoon who are, who are in a conservation fellowship, and I told them that I was going to be chatting with you this afternoon, and many of them were just over the top because they so ad admire your work because it has that notion of, of learning from. It is about, it is, um, heart driven you know it's heart driven attention to the to so called scientific phenomena and the students were lamenting that you know every one of them just as you just said come into science for love of the natural world and and a lot of the way that that uh, so much scientific writing, scientific higher education, to tell mm -hmm. the truth, rings that passion out. You know, it becomes this all about this pure objectivity and that we have to set our, our regard and reverence for those other beings aside. And, and so what the students were saying is that um, your work reminds them of why they became scientists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I've just, I've just um, one of the pieces in the book is what the, the title um, piece. Sorry, I'll stop talking about my book. I know I'm supposed to, aren't I? That's the whole point. Of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the title essay is called Vesper Flights. And we talked a little when we had our practice about this notion of the term Vesper and, and how beautiful it is, this wonderful kind of devotional evening uh, word. 
And what Vespa flights are are things that I would never have known about if I hadn't poured through scientific papers. Um, so common swifts, the very aerial insect-eating birds that don't land for three years after they fledge, every dusk and every single dawn, they fly up. They fly very, very high in the sky and they fly all together and they crest the top of the atmospheric bound, the convective boundary layer, and they get to a point where they can see the stars, they can calibrate their magnetic compasses, they can actually see um, clouds on the horizon hundreds of miles away. It's like this moment, what they're doing is they are oriented, orienting themselves and they're predicting what will happen next. And there's something about this gathering of souls that all together to, um, to sort of to learn from each other and know where they were, you know, what they're going to do next and what the weather will be. That seems so meaningful to me right now in this time of kind of, you know, important demonstrations and terrible things happening in, in all sorts of parts of the world. I would never have known that if it hadn't been for the dedicated work of behavioral ecologists and, and, and scientists and, and radar technicians. So I just think that, as you say, there's this interplay between writers who can bear witness and who can talk about what they find in newspapers and the scientists themselves. And it's such an exciting thing to work with as a writer. Mm -hmm. So I went on a bit there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You know, one of the things, Helen, that I especially wanted to ask you is as I was turning the pages, I, I found your comment um, when someone I think quotes you about animals as teachers. You say that animals are not designed to be our teachers. That's not what they were put here for, and yet they are. And, and I so view the plants that way as well, not only in my own life, but it's part of our cultural teachings of the plants are called our oldest teachers. And so I just wondered if you had thoughts about when we change the, our ways of thinking, to think about the, the plants and animals as our teachers, mm -hmm. how do we be better students? How, how do we? I've changed my way of thinking about this. I, for a long time, had this vaguely academic notion that animals merely reflected what the meanings we gave them. It's very hard to see a real animal or a real plant. You, you, you can only ever see it through what you've learned about them before. And it's always a surprise because they're never quite what you expect. But And then this thing happened when I was on tour with HS for Hawk, I kept meeting people. Um, the book is about grief, as many of you know, and about how I managed to deal with it or tried to by training a bird of prey. I don't recommend this as a way of dealing with grief. And I kept meeting people who shared experiences they'd had with animals that had appeared at incredibly important, difficult moments in their life, often with a, with a, during a bereavement process or after they'd lost a loved one. And I started to think initially that it was all just confirmation bias, that these animals were just, you know, they were always there. They just, but then the more I heard, the more I realized that there was something much more astonishing going on. There was something here. And I began to think of animals less as reflections of our own selves and much more like emblems a little bit like tarot cards in the sense that they will come to us and they will tell us the things that we can't see in our own hearts and i and i i believe that absolutely now and um i think we shuttle all of our different epistemologies into different packets we have the science and we have the mystical and we have the new age and we have the, and they're not allowed to touch. And I just believe that they need to touch. They really need to touch. Yes, yes, absolutely. I see that in your writing and and the way that that touching makes them more whole. You know, as, as, as scientists and historians of science, there has been for such a long time this barrier that, um, you know, the finger shaking that if you personify a plant, or animal that we're not allowed to anthropomorphize. But I think what has happened in that, and there's a really good reason for that, you know, animals are not little humans dressed in fur suits, right? They have to <laughs> have their own sovereignty, their own way. Um, but by, by not allowing them to have personhood w is also unfair to them because it 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 truncates the depth of 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 their being and and puts our notions of 
how one is upon them. You know, it made me think, I was just today, um, I encountered, do you know, do you have it as well? I think you do Monotropa uniflora, the Indian pipe, the little. No, we have a similar a similar plant, um, um, and I've seen them. This is the chlorophyll, the one that that exists with the mycorrhizal yes relationship to. So yeah, it has got no chlorophyll. Yeah. It just relies on that relationship. We don't. It's not called Indian pipe. I think it's called something like dead word or something really cheerful. We do have something yeah. like. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So, you, so you know the plant. You know it, it's a it's a plant which feeds on which takes the carbon from the trees via the mycorrhizae, right? Via the fungus. And the paper I was reading called them terrible cheaters. It said that they were um, parasites and and cheaters because they were getting carbon without giving anything back. And so, from an evolutionary biology perspective, they began investigating this. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if it's not about cheating that, you know, there's such a component of, well, you think about property and individuality. What if it's a gift? What if it's a gift? And again, it's a whole frame shift. Suddenly the evolutionary imperative of the individual goes away. You're looking at exactly the same phenomenon of carbon moving between a flower, a tree, and a fungus. And you could frame it as stealing, or you could frame it as giving. And um, that's where, you know, the the notion of, of culture and myth and metaphysics and personhood all have to come come into play. And so I think that as storytellers, we we have a role also in in helping to maybe um, broaden the kinds of scientific questions that get asked um, by by shifting uh, the lens. I love this notion of the Indian pipes just being these exquisite, beautiful gifts and bringing, you know, in this network of gift giving, that's absolutely glorious. And that was one of the moments I think that that blew my mind. It's like, you know, there are all these, these shifts when you, when I just, when I read about the mycorrhizal associations and how intimate they are and it was like when i read about the human microbiome and how you know an enormous part of us is made of bacteria that's it's part of us it's who we are it's not a separate thing and i just think there's moments of decentering this bizarre notion of what a human is and what human life is it's not a it's not necessarily a a survival of the fittest fight for finance it's it's as you say it's a much more gracious and reciprocal thing and that's so needed and I'm, I'm just so excited to just you know find out more <laughs> mm, yeah, well, mm. so, um. you know I see in your writing also um so much that makes me so glad that we're talking and I hope we continue to of love of language and love of um uh, new words. I saw you quote uh, Glenn Albrecht's beautiful word of solastalgia. Oh, that's a good word. That's a sad word. word. Uh, yeah, this 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 notion of the heartbreak, the illness, really, that we suffer um, when our homelands are um, still there. It's a kind of homesickness when your land is still there, but almost unrecognizable because of environmental damage, and um, this loving of the world uh, that we both um, feel, I think, and, and invite our readers to share with us um, comes at that cost of heartbreak, right? Um, it does, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's again, you know, I wrote a lot about grief in my last book. And, and as you know, you know, grief and love are just the two sides of the same thing. And I thought a lot about, well, maybe not enough, but a little bit about the place of grief in, in, in what we're doing as writers writing about the natural world today and, and how much of it is bearing witness and how much of it has to be soaked in grief. We, we have to feel that grief, otherwise we can't go anywhere. We have to feel it. And that's, you know, it's hard. Um, there are also jokes in my book though, Robin. I wanna just say it's not all heartbreak. <laughs> 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 um, what do you think about grief as a as a, you know, because I'm very worried about apocalyptic thinking. I think that quite often stops people doing anything at all. They just freeze and paralyze themselves. And, you know, when apocalypse should properly mean, a, you know, a revelation of things that were always there but couldn't be seen. Do you think grief is something we can work with? I absolutely do. And I think it's important to um, 
uh, differentiate it from despair, right? Um, grief, I agree, is 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 a measure of of how much we love. Um, and so to turn our backs on grief is 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 to turn our backs on who we love and and those those places that that we love. So yeah, I I absolutely want to celebrate the importance of grief. Be, but that grief becomes kind of a medicine to um, to heal us back to that place of of love. Whereas apocalyptic thinking um, does breed, I think, despair. And for me, despair is all about paralysis. You know, you're suffering so much that you can only feel your own suffering. And what we really need is is that grief to compel. Um, what I think of as ecological compassion, right? Um, to know that that the suffering of those those hermit thrushes whose homes have been um, destroyed is and have become climate refugees. We, it, when we connect to that, um, that I think activates us, right? It activates us toward our the various ways, and there are many ways that we are involved in in habitat protection and so forth. Absolutely. Ooh. Um, sorry, I, it's just such a <laughs> no. My my brain's all fizzing. I've got no kind of like way forward from that. It's such an important thing. I'm just sort of dwell on it for a bit. Um, mm. I was thinking about attention again. On um, one of the pieces in the book, there's an astonishing story about. Um, the painter Stanley Spencer, this very bizarre, eccentric, apocalyptic English paper, um, painter from the 19, well, the 20th century. He worked from the First World War on. He was a very strange chap and he got invited to, he was from a small village called Cookham on the River Thames um, in, in England, this very rural village. And he painted, just painted Cookham. He was very insular. He didn't really like to leave Cookham. But for some reason, he ended up on a British council. I know, uh, just I think it was a delegation, a cultural delegation to China in the 1950s. And everyone was a bit sort of freaked out about him coming along because he was a bit unpredictable. And there was apparently a meeting, Robin, where, with um, Zhuang Lei, the premier, in which the premier got up and spoke to the delegation and said, you know, this is what China is like, you know, talked about China and then said to this delegation, what do you think of China? And there was much horror when Stanley Spencer got up, you know, in his grubby raincoat or whatever he was wearing and said, you know, and started talking. And he said to the, the Chinese premier, have you ever been to Cookham? Let me tell you about Cookham. Um, he said, no, I haven't. And it was this most astonishing moment because what happened was um, Spencer started talking about what it was like to live in a village and how everyone just wants to get on with their gardens and they want to keep their chickens and they want to be safe and they want to, re you know, they want to do the things that people do when they're living in a community. And apparently, Zhuang Lei also, who grew up in a village, absolutely was just bowled over by this. And they had this animated conversation about what it's like to live in a village, in a semi-rural village with chickens and gardens or whatever. And it just made me think about how the local can really truly, by virtue of being specific, can be universal. And I think the natural world is so much like that. Mm -hmm. That there's a kind of fellowship across nations that is to do with knowing the natural world well, to paying attention to it. It's not exclusive, it's not nationalistic. It's it's a kind of attention that I think is just really, really thoroughly exciting just by knowing where you are and where your feet are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, and and that it it um, I think it's almost universal. It's like that uh, E.O. Wilson's I love that word of biophilia, right? That that we are innately um, attracted to the living world. So whether you're the Chinese premier or a or a or a village uh, vicar, right? Um, or what <laughs> um, you are. We've been paying attention. We we gravitate toward the living world, and and the way that that um, becomes accessible to us through field guides is something that I love. The way you wrote about that of of the way that 
sort of the evolution of field guides too yeah. um, was, is, is really important. Um, so you, that you get to both the gestalt of, of identifying a bird or a mushroom or a, or, or a moss, but also the, the guiding of, of your eye. And um, I just love the way you described that because it reminded me of growing up um, in, in our house. We, we didn't have a lot of extra income but uh, we had a shelf full of field guides. Um, all those beautiful yellow and blue field guides that um, were a constant source of, of delight in the winter just to page through them, but then in the, in the growing season to take them outside, you know, by the pond or by the river or whatever, and, and, and do that, that wonderful puzzle work of finding out who's who. Um, and I felt such a bond with you when I read your yeah, description. Really do. When, I, when I read about you yeah. as a young botanist with all your seeds under your bed, I was like, oh, what about... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, that thing that you know, field guides. You know, I, I'm such a, I'm such a nerd. I really am. But I, I love that moment when I realised that they're not transparent windows on the world. You have to learn how to read a field guide. They're quite mm -hmm. complicated things, and particularly, I guess, in botany, you've got your keys and you've got to, you know, it's a, it's a proper bit of arcane knowledge to know how to, how to, um, how to use them. And I think in this country, it's quite exciting. There's, there's been a, um, a real movement over the last you know, few years. There's a real sense that we have lost environmental literacy in this country. And I think they've just begun to implement a natural history exam for 16 year olds, which is gonna be so wonderful. Um, is, is there any sort of sense of that happening in America? Is there, is there a, any kind of calls for a increased natural history knowledge for children or is that still something which is? There's certainly a call for it, but we don't have any equivalent of, of a natural history exam. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but environmental education is, is required in a lot of, 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 of courses. And mostly it is natural history and a lot of environmental threat yeah work um which um I, to me that's really not the way i want to teach young folks about the world is to say well everything around you is falling apart um i i think first to engage that you know the wonder and and the connection and the love and then ask well and so how are you going to stand beside these beings that you love. Um, and within environmental education in this country, there, there is a move toward a greater grounding in values and in, um, in literature and art as ways of connecting to the living world, uh, not just science. Um, and uh, so that that's hopeful. But man, I would love it if we had um, natural history. Yeah, it's really history. exciting. Yeah. yeah. I just you know, to, sorry, reminds me of that moment where you, you know, asking students, you know, what would it, what would it feel like if you thought about the earth loving you back and people being absolutely, you know, it's, it's an unthinkable concept, you know, it's to try and, and, and I, and I was, I had a bit of a shock when I read that, when I first read your book, that moment, it's like, I never thought, yeah, I'm so used to it being portrayed as a place of constant loss and ruin. That the notion that the earth might love what love love humans, you know, I I I mean, I'm not shy to it, but I burst into tears, Robin. I just, you know, it was just such a moment. So thank you for that. Yeah, it breaks my heart to think that there would, and maybe we are at that time, that you know, just as things fall apart, is the time when people realize that, like, wait, I didn't even know you loved me. I didn't know that's what those berries and flowers and swifts were about. Um, it's part of what it's about. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I want to give you a hug. <laughs> I, I want to go birding with you. I want to walk I in the garden. Can I, can I go moth hunting with you, Robin? I'd love that. We'll go. I'll come plant hunting. I, if I can get over there at any point, I will let you know. I'd love to do that. That would be lovely. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Hi, I think the whole audience is crying now. <laughs> you, this, this conversation has been referred to many, many, many times in the chat as an absolute gift. And we are just, just oh, so thankful that you were both able to join us. Um, we have questions popping up and I wanted to get to those uh, uh, in just a little bit. I, I was loath to stop the conversation, but uh, needs must last. 
Um, so currently, uh, the, the question that I want to start with um, is from Terry uh, in Iowa. And Terry asks, uh, to please share a bit about your writing process or your research process and um, just extrapolate a little bit on how you discover your ideas that you then take in and write about. That notion of how do you discover oh. ideas, um, I, it just makes me laugh because it's I, I, it's not for me part of the process. They, they're just always there. It's like, oh my gosh, look at that. I wonder what the connection there is. What's the, yeah. so discovering what what to write about is, um, is for me not the issue, maybe filtering, you know, filtering which are the most important things to 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 write about. And um, for me, it's those things that connect people and increasingly now connect people to 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 action. Um, I think I've been feeling deeply the urgency of the moment. Um, how about you, Helen? Well, it's it's interesting that this this connection. Some of the pieces in it were commissioned, so I was told the subject, which is exciting. Actually, it's a really interesting thing to sort of work on a topic that you wouldn't have thought about, but suddenly becomes full of the themes that you're interested in. Um, but I like to think of essays as, as there's something about the form that I absolutely adore. This notion that you have these concentrated, full bursts of attention and love on something small. And then from the small thing, you can kind of unwrap much bigger stories. Um, quite often it's a bit of going for a walk and seeing an Indian pipe or seeing a broken eggshell. There's something very small that draws your eye. Um, and quite often puzzles. So um, I'm getting an echo. I don't know who that is. Can you hear an echo? Mm -mm. I do. Okay. So, um, for example, you know, ne nearly hitting a deer in the car. I started thinking about deer and cars and car accidents and the deer's world and our world and how I've not really. So they, they, they tend to come quite organically and they tend to come quite fast. But quite often there'll be that weird thing where I'll think I'll be writing about something and then the essay after a while starts to explain to me that that's not what I'm writing about at all and I have to start again. So it's always a conversation, isn't it, Robin? I don't know about you, with when you're writing, the, the, the piece pushes back. It's a bit like wrangling a horse or something. It, it Sometimes they, they won't go where you'd like them to go, but you have to follow them. Mm -hmm. And and for me, there, likewise, there's that process of the microcosm and the macrocosm. It, it doesn't, and I, I think it, sometimes I laugh and think it's as my training as a bryologist, you know, to look at the world in a tiny little clump of moss, yeah. but then to try to understand what it means in the bigger picture. And to me, that is very much what essay writing is about. Um, and sometimes it starts with, with a big idea that I want to say, well, who's the best storyteller for this? What what plant, what, what river, what experience might be the best storyteller for that? But there's so much of that um, zooming in from the, from the macrocosm to the microcosm back and forth. And, and that too is where sometimes I will say, oh, I, I didn't know that's what I was writing about. And there it is. <laughs> I have to continually mute and unmute because my budgies in the background are causing noise. I, I love the sound of parakeets. It's very common. <laughs> They're, yes, they, they like to be a part of the conversation. Um, All righty. So um, my next question or the next question that we've, um, that we uh, have for you is um, what practices help you find hope during our times of solo nostalgia? Oh, that's it's tough, I know. I'm sorry, you can take a moment, I promise. <laughs> I, I, what practices? Um, they can be very small things. I put up some nest boxes around the eaves of my house and I have, um, there's a problem around here that we have increasingly dry springs and these little birds, they build nests out of about a thousand beakfuls of mud, um, like a kind of wasp's nest made of mud. And every spring the last few years, not only we had a terrible decline in insects, but also um, there's no mud for them to build. And a lot of birds haven't been building. So I put some nest boxes up and now I have um, 
I think I'm going to probably fledge about 40 birds this year. They double clutch. So I can look up in the evenings when, this, when there's, the air is still and I can look up and I can see scores of young martins that have shared a home with me that wouldn't be here unless I put those nest boxes up. It's things like that, just little, you know, we, we, we're, we're told so often that we can solve these problems ourselves, that it's an individual responsibility to use different light bulbs or drive cars a bit less, when in fact it's these ravenous structures of, of late capitalism that are the problem and we're told that you know it's not that it's it's us so uh, you know we we should fight and we should mourn and we should i think collective action is necessary um but also we should put nest boxes up that's my answer <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm finding great hope at this point in the in things like the the movements of resistance um because i agree the there are, you know, all of the books of a thousand things you can do to save the environment. Yes, do them, choose them. <laughs> um, to think about what are the things that we love so much that that we will carry them to the other side of the, of these troubles. Um, and if we each choose those things that we love and invest in them, then that that gives me hope. But the resistance movements to say, no, not on my watch. I'm, I am not going to let this happen. Um, it's so important because otherwise the notion that that I'm going to, uh, that my, my recycling is going to change the great ocean plastic patch, that's nonsense. It's not going to happen. Um, so we have to, to really advocate for systemic change. Mm -hmm. And nest boxes, and my nest box equivalent comes actually from grief. Um, of of looking at our northern species becoming climate refugees and moving away from us, I, it breaks my heart to think about uh, there not being sugar maples here in the heart of of Maple Nation, and in that grief, I opened one of my garden catalogs and it said a polar peach suitable for upstate New York. I said, what, that I could grow a peach in upstate New York? It both broke my heart that that would be possible and said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I have been working hard to do in this tiny nest box sort of way, create what I'm calling my climate change forest. I live in the country and the trees that I'm planting are not trees of this place. They're trees of a few places south from here. Um, tulip poplars and Kentucky coffee trees and, and oaks that that don't occur here, but they will. They will, they will occur here. And there's a part of me that I just want to um, contribute to that small step of, of helping them get here, of helping forests walk right. northward. They move so slowly and you're doing the, that work for them. You're bringing them in with love and putting them places they can thrive in the future. That's really, it's both heart-rendingly sorrowful, but also an occasion for joy. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the chat, Jamie asks if you can elaborate more on your climate change forest. Sure, <laughs> it's it's great. It's grandiose to call it a, a forest. It's maybe about <laughs> forty trees. <laughs> um, hey. It's something, um, but you know, I'm already seeing the fact that trees that I put in. Um, while ago, uh, things like uh, elderberries um, are, there's they're starting to sprout up all over because I planted one patch and the birds, thank you very much, they did their well. work. They did their work. Um, so yeah, the notion of the of the climate change forest is, is um, really is just trying to help build resilience. We know that habitat connectivity and 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 uh, assisted migration is um, is a very large policy level conservation strategy. But couldn't we as 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 land care caretakers do the same? Um, and if all of us did that, then we would contribute greatly to that. Um, so that's the notion. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. We have a question from Bev. Bev says, I'm a teacher about to work with sixth grade students in English language arts. 
One of my goals is to incorporate natural history and the practices of observation into our reading and writing. Loving the starting idea of heart-directed attention, do either of you have any other jumping off points you recommend I bring into my classroom to inspire my students as naturalist writers? Ooh, if you can't get them outside, oh, um, I don't know. I was I was a very gothic naturalist when I was a child. I was always bringing dead things home. So, <laughs> I you know my my poor parents. I you know I'd find road killed birds and I cut the wings off and dry them on bits of board. I mean, I just don't know if that's acceptable these days. Um, I think children have a really strong appreciation of the slightly gruesome though. So I think anything that was once dead um, is gonna be exciting for them. Sorry, that's a terrible answer. I don't know. <laughs> Robin, help me here. <laughs> something alive, Helen. <laughs> something alive. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that I really love doing with with my students and and as well as with kids K12 kids is to get away from the fact that natural history is all about names that we must learn what Linnaeus called that plant or that bug you know um well since when um one of the things that I love to do to to get kids to pay attention and then to translate it in into a language or story is to have them make up names for the plants um um, so that who cares what the field guide calls it? Um, spend enough time with that plant um, that that you know what its name is because you've made a relationship with it, um, and and they come up with funny names and and you know a lot of them based on on um, uh, you know what the what it looks like, but also just funny things that it reminds them of a of a character or something, and then they'll remember that that plant forever and they eventually could you know know what its scientific name is I suppose but that's not the point the point is to create relationship and and making up names um, that's really cool. Cool. yeah that's absolutely fabulous I love 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 that technique so we have um, we have a viewer with us from Illinois um, who is working on a native prairie garden uh, and the specialist they have worked with encourages them to use, uh, to continue planting natives because even in this time of dramatic change, they will be more resilient plants, even if more superficially better adapt, even if there are other, you know, plants superficially adapted to higher temperatures, et cetera. Um, so are grasses and flowers different from trees in that respect? I don't know if that question was clear enough. Are you, are you talking about the fact that it's a very biodiverse collection? I, I, I suppose it seems. Yeah, it's, 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 it seems no. It's the. It seems as though the um, the the person who asked the question wants to know if um, grasses and trees are 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 different than or grasses and flowers sorry are different than trees in sort of their adaptability um, to to different climates and their their ability to sort of flourish regardless of of what the climate is like. That's a really insightful question that you try to think about how to um, support plants in climate change times. But you can't make a real judgment about that within the trees that are specialists of wide ecological amplitude and those who of narrow and, and wide ecological amplitude. I wouldn't say that it could really be ascribed to, differently to, to wildflowers. And, and to grasses, but to plant local um, natives, of course, because those natives evolved in that place in the really broad scope of the extreme habitats that are um, that they they have experienced. Um, so I think that in terms of, of resilience, of course, native species are always going to be um, uh, more appropriate. Of course, of course. Um... I assume that they would then be more better suited to the long-term survival in that area as opposed to non-native species. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Wonderful. Yeah. Good, right. luck with, good luck with the, with the restoration. Mm -hmm, definitely. Lynn and Marissa say thank you. <laughs> um, both of you have talked about the role of grief and attention in, con in uh, connection, sorry, I totally misread that question. Both of you have talked about the role of attention in connection, grief, love, and compassion for our more than human kin. 
On the note of young people and students, how do you help call people, young and old, back to attention and intention in times of finding prevalent and easy distraction? It's long, I apologize. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to jump in, Robin. Do you want to go ahead with this? No, or? go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm very interested in how um, there is a definite kind of sneering among some people at, for example, smartphones. Um, they are generally offered as the antithesis of natural historical pursuits. And yet I look on Twitter and I see young people every day photographing strange plants, strange fungi, things that they don't know what they are and posting them and saying, what is this? Um, I think there's a kind of attention that might be short, but it is extremely focused. And I really do, I am quite encouraged that this easy accessibility of cameras, that this notion of that, you know, you can capture things and ask experts who are just waiting for you there on, on the internet. It's a real democratization of natural knowledge. I mean, you know, you don't need a textbook or a field guide. You can just ask people and then you can forge communities. Um, I'm really hopeful about the attention. And I mean, I've, you know, my young niece, I remember when she was small, finding a drinker moth caterpillar crawling across a path, she was transfixed with it for minutes on end. You know, live things, as Robin, I'm sure, will agree, they are deeply fascinating to children in a way that lots of other things just don't hold attention. Mm -hmm. And especially the ability to, to use um, digital devices for photographs, yeah. because it does invite one um, to look very, very closely. And a number of my students um, are just in love with the iNaturalist functions so that when they find that caterpillar or a, a plant that seems out of range, they can consult a community. They can drop a pin and say, well, I found this here. It, it's a way to participate in, in citizen science. Um, so agreed. Um, I don't think there has to be a, a ban on those, on those tools at all. But the students and the young people that we're talking about are people who are already attending to the natural world and wanting to share that. Um, I do think that there's tremendous merit in, in setting aside time without digital devices to just go and look using those amazing devices that we were given of, our, of all of our senses that have truly become attenuated um, by, by not using them. And there's something really exciting about connecting, like with birds, you know, when I began um, birding so long ago, the hunt of following that, so that song, who is it, who is it, who is it? It might've taken an hour to yeah. find out who was singing that, but I will never forget it because it was an adventure. Um, it engaged your, you know, all of your senses. And then hopefully you, you found out who it was at the end. And, and if you didn't, well, then you just start over again the next time with a higher level of, of, of acuity. So um, that, that kind of pursuit is really fascinating. You know, I've had friends who've tried to learn bird song from, um, from apps, but without, tracking those songs down and seeing the birds singing, it's very hard to remember. Um, as you say, it's that journey, it's that discovery, that little quest that fixes the two together in your mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Ugh. I, bird, bird song is, is one of the great mysteries of, of, of my own naturalist experience. And I just, it's, it's one of the most fascinating things to me to, to try to figure out which bird is singing which song and it's wonderful. Um, you are both, of course, naturalists, um, but you are also both readers, you know, as well as writers. Is there an author that you read either or both of you read that you wish more people knew about? That question is, is another one from Terry in Iowa. What? <laughs> yeah. Um... I'm 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 stumbling on that that I wish more people knew about um, uh, because I I I guess one of my favorite writers is Louise Erdrich, um, the the wonderful Anishinaabe um, novelist, um, and um, but but I think she's 
very well known and beloved, so I'm failing on that part of the question. <laughs> I always want to make up a writer when I get asked this question that no one's heard of because they don't. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So, I mean, again, a very well known, but I just think if anyone hasn't read the collection of essays by Elena Passarello called Animals Strike Curious Poses, just get out there and buy it. It's um, one of the most astonishing books I've ever read. It's a collection of essays and each one is about a different named animal through human history and her style, her prose style kind of weirdly and strangely and beautifully mimics both the animal and the historical period. There's like you know, Mozart's Starling and Darwin's Tortoise and it's heartrending, and it's so beautiful. And I think it's one of the greatest books ever written on animals. So I highly recommend that. Elena Passarello. Can you say the name again, Elena Passarello. Mm. But there's lots of writers, lots of writers. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's about eight, uh, and this is about the time um, where um, none of us want to say goodbye, but uh, I'm going to extend it a little bit with one more question uh, from Emily, another Emily, different Emily. Um, do you have any ideas on how we as a society can better facilitate collaborations between creative thinking and scientific thinking? How can creatives participate in the world of scientific information gathering and analysis? Hmm. One of the things that I, I guess I would want to bring to attention is um, official formal collaborations that have been going on recently through the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I was stunned uh, to, to learn this and indeed to participate in it, that the, the Forest Service um, has put together um, long-term ecological reflections sites, just as they have long-term ecological research sites, um, to invite writers um, and in some places dancers and graphic artists to the forests um, to work alongside the scientists um, to create a, a record of a data record in a sense of, of human response to place and the kinds of exciting uh, collaborations and wonderful evocative artwork that has come from that has been uh, profound what about you helen i think there are similar programs here um, and i've been to a few Obviously, these are, you know, they're not open, haven't been open to everyone, but, but there have been certain kind of collaborative meetings between scientists and artists. Um, I went to one at the British Antarctic Survey a few years ago, which was astonishing. And just opening up those spaces where conversations can be had, I think, is extremely important. Um, but I do, I, th I don't know, I just think also, I think... Um, we tend to get so trapped in our own genres. And I always try and push myself a bit. You know, I'll try and read, I'll try and go on the internet and read some papers from a scientific field that I am baffled by. I mean, I can't get as far as string theory. I don't understand what's going on there, but I can make a stab at some atmospheric science papers, you know, and I won't understand every word. It's a bit like when you were reading when you were very small, you didn't understand what all the words meant, but there's something about just trying that, and then maybe chasing up people and, you know, forging bonds with with scientists that just in an individual level and, and, and talking about their work, you know, just anything that one can do to, to foster conversation, I think, is important. I mean, that rests on a lot of privilege, obviously, you know, that you can get to meet scientists, but that are working on the stuff you're interested in. But um, I think any attempt is, is good. Is good. And again, Twitter and, and, the, and the Internet is a really great place to start those conversations. I think also in education, um, I think about in so much science education is um, is very compartmentalized. And, and to be able to say that being able to tell a good story about what you have observed and, and concluded should be a part of every scientist's education. Uh, so um, j just fluency in, in, in storytelling, um, I think should really be encouraged in, in all those realms. Yeah. Oh, we're all back. Hello. 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 No, I'm on. Uh, hi, Carrie. Hey. Well, we have booksellers in the chat field selling more books based on the topics that you guys are talking about. Booksellers are going to booksell. Yeah. So thank you, guys. 
Um, it is getting time to wrap up. Is there anything that we didn't touch on or any moments or uh, messages that we need to carry forward with, with us? I have to know who has a peacock outside their window. I can hear Cool. Just making sure it's not that that was. I thought I was, I thought I was in my room. My neighbors have peacocks, and yes, this oh, is their Yeah, I am sure that that is an absolute delight to live next door to peacocks. <laughs> yes, word. Correct. It's, it's, it's been absolutely lovely. Robin, it's been an honor and a pleasure talking to you. Again, I hope we connect up in real life at some point. It would be lovely. Likewise. Um, and, yeah, thank you to everyone who's been watching and listening. I'm sorry yeah. I can't be with you in person, but it's been lovely. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Helen. You all. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Milkweed and Grove. I go for walks in the woods nearly every day, and I'm going to be carrying you guys with me for, for months and years to come. So we've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and we'll see you next time. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.